Hello everyone, it is Joe here from Omnipoke, the channel that brings you guys everything Pokemon. And today we are going to be looking at a Psychic Malamar list. It's a deck that I've been playing pretty much all quarter, so I have a good amount of experience with this deck. I've played it in a regional and in two cups. Uh, I've got points at all of those three tournaments with this deck. Uh, I've been playing around with counts and the list itself for a long time now and I think I have a pretty good grasp of what the deck aims to try and do and the best way to try and do that. So uh, just before the AIC I thought it was worth getting a few more decks in there because it has been a little while a hiatus that I've had with my injury and I've also had bad hay fever and a few other things going on but hopefully I can get a few lists out just before the AIC and tell you my decision making process around all these counts because there are some interesting things in this list in particular. Uh, so let's jump into it. First of all, we're playing a 4-3 line of the Malamar. Obviously, these are going to be the in-case we play. We don't want to play the Fighting Weak ones. And uh, the Psychic Recharge Malamar is what the entire deck is based around. Once during your turn, you may attach a Psychic Energy from your discard pile to one of your benched Pokemon. We're going to try and get multiple Mallies on the board so we can start powering up multiple big attackers for one-hit KOs turn after turn. That is the intention of this list. Uh, the big one hit KO machine himself is going to be the Necrozma GX, the regular one, has 180 hit points, has the Light's End ability, preventing all damage done to this Pokemon by attacks from colourless Pokemon. That's pretty much exclusively important for Drampa right now in the format, even then uh, not too big of a deal. Uh, but Prismatic Burst is his main attack for three colourless, it does 10 base and you get to discard, or you have to discard all Psychic Energy attached for him, and it does 60 more for each energy you discard in this way. So. By discarding the requisite 3 energy, you're doing 190 damage. Throwing an extra energy on top means you're blowing up everything in the format, which is pretty awesome. It does have a Black Ray GX attack as well. Uh, this does 100 to each of your opponent's Pokemon GX and EX. Uh, the uh, damage isn't affected by weakness or resistance, but that's still pretty handy. Uh, doing this big spread of 100 to everything um, can be pretty dangerous in certain situations. And uh, it can finish something off if you set it up with a KO earlier with, with one of your potentially smaller attackers. And in, just in general is a good way to put lots of damage counts on the board if, for example, you've missed a Guzma on a certain turn, you want to get an attack in when the opponent has like a non-EX in the active, and uh, you can still do plenty of damage all at once, especially for like Zoroark decks. Gets them all uh, in a much nicer range of damage for you, which is very uh, good to note because this is a pretty important matchup that we need to try and cover. So... From there, we're going to play two of the Dawnwind's Necrozma GX. This is another key component of the deck. That's why we're playing two copies of it. And uh, it also has 180 hit points. It's an Ultra Beast. Um, it has the ability Invasion. Once during your turn, if this Pokemon is on your bench, you may switch it with your active. This is obviously huge because Malamar can only power up bench Pokemon. So if there's been something in your active the turn before, like the regular Necrozma that's had to remove all of its energy from itself, you can use Invasion with the Dawn Wings, get a bunch of Malamars to power it up, and then retreat yourself straight back into that new attacker. So Invasion is very, very helpful. Even in the early game against things like Buzzwall, which loves attacking turn one, but they're one energy attackers. This can be thrown into the active just to protect things like Inkays, because this also has fighting resistance, which is a big, big deal, making it very tanky and very good against Buzzwall players in general because of its typing, in addition to this awesome resistance. One very awkward note for this card, though, is that it does have dark weakness, so you have to use this very sparingly against Zoroark, if not at all, if you can help it. Uh, however, it's awesome in the discard pile against Zoroark, and we'll talk about that later with Marshadow. It does have two attacks. Uh, dark Flash for three Psychic, just does 120, isn't affected by resistance, which is very cool. Um, again, pretty much the only thing that resists is dark stuff, so you don't really want to be swinging with this guy unless it's in the worst case scenario, or if you're like finishing something off the game. Uh, so yeah, just a good sort of two hit KO, very solid, obviously one hit KOing Buzzwell GXs and Baby Buzzwells, so that's good to note. And Moon's Eclipse GX is an awesome attack, it does 180. You can only use it if you're behind on prize cards, and uh, it also states prevent all effects of attacks, including damage done to this Pokemon during your opponent's next turn. So the idea is hopefully you have no other GXs on your bench when you're attacking with this GX Pokemon. So if they are going to go for a Guzma play, you're forcing them to an uh, odd prize trade, which is very good for you. Uh, if that's not possible, potentially you're just doing this later on in the game with like an N and hoping that they don't have Guzma. Uh, either way, you're forcing them to have these cards to do anything on their turn damage wise. So very, very good awkward GX attack that can be a great comeback mechanic uh, for this deck. From there, we have a couple of one-off attackers. 
First of them is going to be Mewtwo GX. I think this is a really awesome one. Very, very good for a number of matchups. Has 190 hit points, which is cool, and it has three attacks. The first is Full Burst. Does 30 times the amount of energy attached to this Pokemon. Uh, so obviously that ramps up as you go, and you can get into one hit KO range if you really have enough Malamars and such on the board. It then has Super Absorption for a Psychic Colors, which does 60, and you heal 30 from this Pokemon. Alongside Fighting Fury Belt, this is an amazing way to get through multiple Baby Boswell in the early game. Just two energy and that Fighting Fury Belt, and you are swinging through them. Their early game prods are being reduced because you have more hit points next to the Fury Belt and your healing as well. So oftentimes the Mewtwo is going to take three prizes on his own if they're just sending in Baby Boswells against you. You pretty much force them to get out a Lycan Rock against you, which is very, very cool. Speaking of Lycan Rock, uh, Mewtwo is actually very good at dealing it with it himself. Uh, for 3 Psychic, it can do 200 damage, and it isn't affected by any effects on the opponent's active Pokemon. Bear in mind, uh, effects does not mean weakness or resistance, that's a separate mechanic. So don't start Fury Belting Mewtwo and trying to swing into Zoroark, that's a bad idea. I've to uh, a few of my friends have told me that they can do that, and no, <laughs> it's not right. So yeah, Side Strike, very good for um, uh, Lycan Rocks. Uh, very good for opposing things that aren't weak to Psychic, like dealing with Dawn Wings and Mirror and stuff because this does get around the Dawnwings' uh, GX attack, so you can respond on them without the needs of a Guzma. So Mewtwo, very good for dealing with Lycanroc, very good for dealing with Baby Buzzwalls, very good for Mirror, thanks to uh, dealing with Dawnwings, even through their GX attack, and also very good for Greninja, actually, because, again, with this Fury Belt, you're putting pressure on from turn two, getting knockouts on the Frokies and Frogadiers, uh, and because you're doing this healing, seeing as though we have the Giratina promo in our deck as well, it means they're doing pretty much nothing to you as you can just slowly attach up to full burst range whilst super absorptioning each turn, getting two shots on the regular Greninjas while they're doing like, no damage to you at all. So it's a very, very, very good Pokemon against Greninja as well. So multiple reasons why he's in here. He just becomes an excellent attacker in a lot of matchups just randomly at, at times as well because his energies stack up. So he's just really, really good. From there, we are going to play this one copy of Marshadow GX. Its ability means that we can use the attacks of any basic Pokemon in our discard pile. So that's why I mentioned the Dawnwings in the bin earlier on. And that's really for Zoroark because we are a fighting type. Marshadow can copy the attacks here. And oftentimes, because Zoroark is quite a fast deck, they're going to be taking single prizes on your Inkays and Malamars early more than likely. So the idea is going to be get a Dawnwings into the discard pile, use your GX attack, with Marshadow copying uh, Dawn Wings to get yourself um, one knockout on Zoroark. Then they have to Guzma around the Marshadow. Um, so oftentimes the Marshadow will stay on the board with all of its energy on, and they can deal with another Zoroark the turn after. So you're trying to get Marshadow to net you four prizes, ideally, against Zoroark, thanks to the use of that GX attack. Um, even if you can't use that GX attack, it's one energy less than a regular, um, what's it called, Prismatic Burst. So... Uh, thanks to resistance and such, um, that he's still just efficient or more efficient than anything else in your deck. And because Zorok is going to be using Parallel City, Goosebring up your Malamars as well if you overextend, you really want to be saving yourself one or two attachments here or there throughout the game. So even if he's not doing a big GX attack play, he's still going to be a very efficient attacker at dealing with Zorok. If you can Fury Belt him, you can force them to have Field Blur along other lines as well. So... That can be a nice addition for you. You basically force them to have choice band for your blower in the same turn as well as a full bench and a DCE. So especially if the Marshall is munching through their Zoroark, so you can make it hard for them to find that combination. So very good one of as well. And finally, it's going to be the Giratina. Yes, he's in here for Greninja. Uh, each Pokemon break has no abilities. Um, so this is very cool. You obviously stop the Greninja from using the Shurikens. But additionally, because we have such good Psychic Acceleration in here, he becomes a decent attacker, once again, against things like Boswells, and even in Mirror at times as well. A Shadow Claw for two Psychic and two Colorless. I know it's expensive, but you do have the Accelerators here for you. It does 110, and you discard a random card from your opponent's hand. This can, in random spots, be really nice, especially in combination with an N. If it's late game, you can N and Shadow Claw. Hope to snatch that Guzma out of their hand or whatever they had, and make their outs a lot lower to having game against you. So this, in random times, can bail you out, of course. This again has resistance to fighting, so Fury Belting this guy is an absolute nightmare for Boswell players. Uh, you sometimes force a Lycanroc to GX a one prize Pokemon, and that is so, so good for you. So, yeah, the Giratina alongside that Fury Belt is definitely a big deal for you. 
Finally, I'm playing just the one copy of Tapu Lele GX. This is the big decision that I've had to make. And it's really from this month or so, or two months of testing the deck, that I know how tight the bench is for this list. You want to have three Inkays building up into Malamars. You want to have at least one main attacker, probably one other charging up on the bench. So you never have space for two Lele to be on your board unless you're getting game that turn. So I'm happy playing just the one copy, as long as you don't prize it, of course. So... The Lele is integral for you getting Bridget and getting going in a lot of situations, but because we have seven ball search cards and the four Inkays in the first place, there are turns when you don't need to Bridget turn one. You can just naturally draw or naturally search out lots of Inkays. So it's not integral that you use the Lele early. Additionally, there's so much Paradox City in the format right now that the Lele can oftentimes hit the bin, and then you can stretch it back for late game as well. So I'm fairly confident that one copy is enough as long as you're okay not prizing it. Right now, I'm prioritizing an 11th energy and a second Fury Belt over the second Lele. That's really up to you. Again, I think four copies of Guzma is mandatory for this deck because we don't have a draw engine, so you need to be able to find Guzma off of N a lot of the time. Uh, so I want to have as high a count as that as possible. If you're feeling a little bit worried about the one prize of Lele, you could go to three Guzma and play a second copy. But right now, I'm telling you, the bench is super tight for this list, and... If you put two Lele's on your board at any point, you're in a really bad spot because you'll end up having to swing with one of those Lele's just to get it off your board. So that's why I'm just playing one copy. From then on, we're gonna play one copy of Rescue Stretcher. I just mentioned how it could be a great late game card for Lele. Also pretty good. It allows us to have this 4-3 line of Malamar with a lot more confidence because we can recycle them if they're being paralleled or if they're being uh, taken off the board by a Guzma. Whilst at the same time, you know, we have a bunch of different attackers in here but they're all two ofs and one ofs, so it's important to recycle these. Alongside the Marshadow that can copy stuff once again, even in matchups where you're not hitting for weakness, this is like an extra copy of your best attacker in that matchup. So I think even though they are sort of skimpy lines of main attackers, because we have the Marshadow and the Stretcher, we do kind of get away with it. From there, I'm going to be playing three copies of Field Blower. I really like the high count of Field Blower right now. Parallel is a huge pain in the neck for this deck, as well as Garbodor. It's only natural to have a high Field Blower count. And it means against these buzzwalls, you can always be getting rid of their stadium cards, always be getting rid of their float stones, and try and hurt their tempo as much as possible. So Field Blower, I think, is a really big card at the moment, and that's why I'm choosing to play three copies. Instead of cutting down to, like, two and trying to shove in my own parallel, I think that's pretty greedy. I'd rather have big defense against it from other players, so you can remove it straight away. Three copies of Max Elixir, it lets us be very aggressive against buzzwall players. That's the biggest thing that we need to note here, because otherwise baby buzzwalls can start putting this preliminary damage on your GXs or even taking single prizes on Inkays very on early on in the game and you don't have any response because they're dealing with your energy accelerator. So you need to have Max Elixirs rolling on so you can bring in the Dawn Wings turn two is your um, optimal play. Uh, otherwise it could be a Mewtwo turn two alongside a Fury Belt. That would also be amazing for you. Um, so that's kind of what we're going for here. Try and get those early Dawn Wings, try and get that early Mewtwo down. If you're up against Zoroark players, you want to be Prismatic Bursting a Zoroark by turn two. So that's going to take some big strides. And oftentimes Elixir's going to help us get there. So uh, three important copies that I think most people land on. I've again experimented with four. Four is obviously good. You see them more, uh, but space is space at the end of the day. And again, I'm prioritizing Fury Belts just for math fixing. Um, then we're going to play seven ball search cards, four of them being Ultras. Ultra can get everything in the deck except for Marshadow. And uh, Mysterious Treasure gets everything in the deck for one card cheaper, so that feels like a good deal to me. On to the supporters, we are going to play one copy of Bridget. It's still, you know, ideal to go for that turn one, like Treasure for Lele, Lele for Bridget. That's still amazing for you. You get multiple Inkays down on that board. You get your main attacker rolling, hopefully with a turn attachment or an Elixir or something like that to boot, and you're pretty much good for the following turn. Oftentimes only needing like one Malamar to see you into the next turn, so that's pretty good. From there, we're going to be playing three copies of Cynthia alongside three copies of N. For the longest time, I was playing two Cynthia, three N, and one Orangaroo, but I've already made the statement that bench space is really tight with this deck, and as much as I love Orangaroo, if anyone knows from the streams or from anything else, it's a, it's a card that I absolutely love. Um, it can save you in many awkward spots. Uh, I've had to make the gruesome cut right now just for the reality check of how much parallels in the format really uh so i'm just playing a physical extra cynthia right now i think it allows you to bridge it turn one a lot more often as well because you have this 
you have more physical supporters to help you out, so you're more likely to have a ball search card plus a draw supporter to follow that up with. So I'm fairly happy with the 10 count overall of N, Cynthia, and Sycamore. You can play around with these as you like and try out Orangaroo. I have loved it in the past. Uh, four copies of Sycamore as well. Uh, obviously, discard draw is nice, getting psychic energies in the bin and seeing as many cards as possible to get our combos going because at the end of the day, we are a setup deck trying to get these stage ones online, multiple of them. So Sycamore's going to help us get there. And finally, four copies of Guzma. Again, I'll make the debate about Orangaroo. You could play that over the fourth copy or the second Lele over the fourth copy. Both try and do the same thing. They're trying to get you game. That's kind of what we're trying to get at here. I like having the aggressive Guzmas as many copies as possible because dealing with like Rockcrofts in the early turns against Buzzwell players is such a big deal. Um, if you can deal with early Rockcrofts without them developing, uh, you basically force them to start beast ringing GXs, which is very good for you. Um, or force them to just like willy-nilly just put another Rockcroft down, cross their fingers that you don't have another Guzma. And when they're doing that, it's just so good for you. So uh, yeah, four copies of Guzma. want to see this a lot because it's a big deal in the format right now. Uh, so yeah, the full four copies there. Onto the tools. I have made space for two Fury Belt. For the longest time, I've not made space for this card. I've eventually gritted my teeth and given in to the fact that this card is very good for math fixing. It means you're much less reliant on Mewtwo GX to finish off Lycan rocks because now you can do it with three energy plus the belt, uh, and you don't have to spend your GX attack as well, which is a good deal. Uh, this makes the Mewtwo a machine against Greninja. It also means that you can hit 130 uh, with Dark Flash against Frogs as well, so that matchup is pretty much nailed on. Plus, Fury Belting a Tina against Buzzwell if they're choosing not to play Field Blur, which the majority aren't right now. There just isn't space in that deck, even though it's a big flaw that it does come with. Uh, Fury Belting this guy is such a headache, such a pain for the Buzzwell players that it's hilarious to see, really. So there you go. Uh, three copies of Floatstone. You kind of want to play four times. You want to play four exactly against Zoroark because you're not using Invasion. In every other matchup, I think three sees you through for the majority of the time. Obviously, Buzzwell players are rarely playing Field Blower, uh, so you'll get around that. You'll have more than enough Floatstones throughout that game. Uh, to use Invasion, jump in and out, and do all your attachment shenanigans. So overall, I think that's going to be fine. And to finish off, I'm going to play 11 copies of Basic Psychic Energy, just because, you know, we need lots of these. I like playing 11 as opposed to 10, because you want to have manual attachments most turns in addition to all these. Um, squids powering up energy, and of course you want your elixirs to hit, even though you are discarding some in the early game. So it's a nice balance overall. Let's have a look at some card editions that we could be interested in. Um, one of the cards that I played in Sheffield, the regionals, was actually one copy of Hooper. Hooper is a nice card. It's a non-GX uh, attacker, which can be, again, a headache for Buzzwell players. Uh, Portal Strike, obviously, dealing the magic number that we need a lot of the time. Also, you can do Hyperspace Punches, which does a similar thing to Fury Belt, in that if you can get a 20 snipe onto a rock rough, that sets it up a lot nicer for your other attackers, so that's good to note. Uh, this 20 damage sniping can be good again in mirrors even. If they have an NK active, you can do a 40-20 and force them into awkward turns ahead, so that can also be nice. Overall, I'm expecting a lot less mirror because Psychic Mama really has sort of gone off the boil a little bit. A lot of uh, top players are discrediting how good the deck is uh, so i would not tech for mirror going into the naic i think you just want to be as streamlined as possible and i've already made the debate a lot of times about how awkward your bench can be sometimes just starting the wrong pokemon can set you off on the bad foot and that's also the case for this card so that's why we're not going to play it um from there there's going to be pressure mewtwo that's uh, a card that a lot of people like experimenting with i've not even traded for one that's because I think it's inferior to the Hooper in the first place just because of that early attachment uh, punching thing around the board that you can do. But pressure does give you a hilarious out to spread because when this is active, um, the bench is also protected for minus 20. So if there are random spread decks around, one pressure Mewtwo can hilariously deal with that. Whilst at the same time being, again, this tanky Pokemon, the resistance is pretty, oh sorry, the ability is pretty much the same as having resistance like we see on the Giratina. But it's one energy cheaper, so it's a real headache once again for these Buzzwell players to get around. So if you're trying to tech for you know, the in-between of Mirror and Buzzwell, this isn't a bad shout for you. He can do a pretty good shift alongside that Hooper could do as well. Here's my boy, unfortunately demoted to the potentially could play zone rather than the actual 60 cards. 
I love having Instruct. It can get you game. It gets you out of tight spots as well when you want to reduce your hand size. But right now, I think the bench is just too critical for this deck. And when you're living in a parallel universe, which we are right now in the current standard, um, there's not much space for him physically on the bench. So that's why we're going to say no to Guru, which makes me very sad and does literally bring a tear to my eye. Uh, the final card I'll talk about is Espeon EX. This is one that sort of was dropped very early. Uh, I remember my very early renditions were testing out the Espeon EX because you can do a Black Ray plus Miraculous Shine combo against Zoroark players. Uh, I think Zoro Rock is likely to only play one Ace Arola. Um, I think Zoro Pod is between one and two, maybe one and one max potion. Uh, so potentially you can get away with the mute, uh, with the Espeon EX play trying to do a black rate into Miraculous Shine, that can really catch uh, Zoro players off guard. So if you're thinking there's going to be enough Zoro arc in the NEIC, which there probably will be, you might want to start testing out Espeon EX because it's actually really cool against the Zoro arc players because really no one expects it right now from um, standard um, Malamar lists because it just hasn't been in the standard Mar uh, Malamar lists for a while. So... That could be a really cool tech card to improve your Zoro matchup if people don't do the cute like Acerola play on the correct turn. So that can really punish them. Even if you're doing that Devolve just for two prize cards, you're taking away you know four draws from their deck as well for future turns. So I think it's a very viable option for you and could really catch some people off guard. In terms of tools and supporters and stuff, uh, we're gonna look at Parallel City. For the first stadium of choice um this deck isn't playing stadiums right now parallel would probably be the one of choice i mean i've tried ultra of the moon and it is really bad uh this of course helps out in a bunch of situations but at the same time it's the card that we're most scared to see so if you're playing a card that then also is nullified because you're already seeing a card that you hate to look at uh, it's just going to make you feel really bad so although it can give you a defense to other people forcing them to have blower plus parallel I think, you know, we don't have a draw engine in this deck, so you just have to be fortunate to draw into your parallels rather than Zorak, which can dig, like, six cards if even they can mallow for it, for example. We can't do that, so they're going to find it faster than you the majority of the time, so I'm just going to let them deal with it and have a high field blow account instead. So that's why I'm not playing parallel, even though it could be, again, a mirror card. I'm not expecting much of it. And the final card that I see a few people play is Lily. Um, you could play this instead of Bridget or alongside whatever you kind of want but now that I've gone down to one Lele it doesn't make much sense for me to play the Lily I don't think because the whole point of you just playing the one Bridget is like you can do it on the turn if you need to but you still have treasures that you can just start searching out your uh, dudes your little squids um, and for the Lily it, it would be like a one-off copy and it sort of makes you go down that line of wanting to Lele turn one so it's just uh, a little bit of a discrepancy there, a little bit of a difference in my list personally. So that's why I'm not making the Lily line. Uh, you could potentially just cut Cynthia for it if you really wanted to, but I don't think it's justified right now in this list. So yeah, that's going to be it for my card decisions. Let's save this list up because I have been tinkering around with a few counts here and there. Uh, but we'll jump onto the ladder and see what people are doing one week, or actually a lot less than a week, a few days from the NAIC now. So should be exciting. I'm expecting a lot of Zoro, a lot of Buzz, a lot of Malamar all on the ladder. So hopefully we get a good representation here and we get a good few games because Psychic Valley is, you know, statistically the fourth best deck in format right now uh, based on results um, leading up to the AIC in this Forbidden Light format. So, um, yeah, it feels like a lot of people rate it a lot worse than this, um, I think. Well, especially Zoropod is actually rated lower on stats right now. I think everyone rates Zoropod above Psychic Mali. I do too. But um, the stats aren't lying, really. It's got a lot of results over the last couple of months. So there's got to be something here. And I think uh, a few games might be able to show off what it can do. So let's uh, go first here. I see a fighting deck box and I immediately smile. We also lead Giratina, which is fine in this matchup. If it is indeed a Buzzworld deck. It looks like we're going to get the benefit of a mulligan here. Our hand's pretty tasty already. Yeah, it looks like it is just going to be a Buzzwall list. Now, Buzzwall is not a free ride for you. It's the only deck I lost to in Sheffield. Um, I also had a tie against it as well, so... Um, it's by no means free, but it is 
favourable, and we yeah. are going first. So all the signs are pointing towards a pretty good time for us here. Now, our opponent does lead Diancy Prism. That's also very good for us. Uh, we draw into a Psychic Energy, which I actually want to manually attach this turn because that's always more important than getting one in the bin right now, especially when we don't look to have a guaranteed Malamar turn two. I think when you play three Field Blower, they're really dispensable in this matchup because it's not huge to get rid of them against anyone else. And turn, uh, game one, uh, we actually do prize our... Um, our one of Lele, which is instant punishment, of course. Uh, but that's fine right now. Uh, we can... I'm actually going to value getting an attachment on a Dawn Wings over getting a Inke down, I think. This is what we want to jump into the active more than anything else. I could also debatably have gone for a Mewtwo here. Uh, but I'm happy to commit a Floatstone here, also an attachment... I would really love to have a Fury Belt on this guy rather than a Floatstone. And I'm thinking I might want to put down this Necrozma to deal with potential Lycanrocs down the line. Um, mainly because I don't want to draw into it again. But uh, I'm going to hold off for now and just play this N here. And hopefully we're drawing to some more Ball Search cards or Incades. And we do indeed do that. Um, our hand isn't taking us much further than that right now. Um, we have one in K, we have the Mysterious Treasure for Malamar next turn, and a Guzma to boot alongside an attachment. So this hand is actually perfect. Let's not get greedy going for a second in K. Let's just be happy with our turn two play that we are looking to have here. If there's a Guzma here, we're going to be a very sad panda on our in K. Otherwise, we're looking pretty happy here. There is the uh, Guzma, which is a shame. Looks like we end him into a pretty nice hand there. And we are going to get hit with a sledgehammer here. Now our hand is actually pretty dead. Uh, we can go into the Tina pretty happily. Um, throwing into another Guzma isn't fantastic. We can turn attach. I'm just going to Guzma this. And retreat back into this. And pass. That should be fine. We're actually not too far behind. We only start falling behind if he starts attaching to Rock Ruffs. And even then we have a second Guzma to follow that up with. So there is the Rock Ruff. Let's see if we can get an attachment to it. And if they can find Floatstone and start attacking. Looks like they just have a second Guzma. It's going to be a Guzma Fest. First three supporters of this game has been Guzma. Well, actually, I, I bet Nen first, but yeah. We did draw back into these cards that we didn't want to draw back into, which is a real shame. Now, they didn't attach to Rockruff, which makes me a lot happier to do this, but we can get blown back by Elixir, Attachment, Evolve, Floatstone, but with a three-card hand, I don't really want to play around that too much. I think I want to just deal with his, uh, with his board right now. Uh... Are you filming? Yep. <laughs> Bloody... Don't worry, just dogs, carry on. The Uh, what's the problem with cats and dogs in our house? The cats haven't had their tea yet. Do you want your tea? Oh, come here, you. Okay, you can stop talking to them now. Okay, I'll stop. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm, I'm right. Let's go. Let's get back into reality here. Okay. Okay, so we've even up the trade. Let's see how good their actual hand was. They were doing some pretty... Like, last turn wasn't a good Guzma. It was a fairly awkward Guzma. So, yeah, it looks like the only supporter they had was N. So that's good for us. We really hope they don't have Elixir Lycanroc here, really. I mean, we don't have uh, a big board. He can just attack an Inkia if he wants to. Unless he has Choice Band as well to boot. He's going to keep Elixiring. These aren't the most threatening targets for us, which is great. Uh, we don't have a Guzma, which is a shame, obviously. Uh, we do have an elixir which we can play here. We're going to start powering up to the Giratina. Uh, do we have any energy in our discard pile? No, not yet, but it's not a big deal. Uh, even though we're going to be knocking out this Diancy, do I want to get rid of a field blower from my hand? I think I do, because we never want to draw these cards. 
because they're pretty useless. And we'll play the Cynthia, obviously, with his three card hand. Now, at the minute, we're most safe by not venting any other Pokemon. So I think that's what we're going to do. I think we're holding everything here and just swinging on this Diancie. It is really nice to swing on Diancie because because uh, that's going to be big for like baby Buzzworlds later down the line. We are going to that four prize card turn. But it looks like he's most likely going to have to try and GX something here. Maybe GX attack by Malamar, something like that. There's a choice band. He attached a basic fighting. So he's probably going to not GX attack the Malamar. He's just going to normal attack the Malamar. Been a very strange game. Goodness, he's benched a buzzball. That's got to be game for us. That's just so good for us. So here's our path. We uh, we Guzmaring this, this turn, he GXs this. So all we need to do is Make sure that we can set up a Mewtwo to deal with his Luganok. And that should be easy enough. Uh, we're searching out... Hmm. Now nah, we still search out the NK here. Even with Elixir plus Fury Belt, I think. Hmm. this, gonna get that later that we took off prizes. Obviously we want to deal with that buzz wall. So 15, 16, 17, 18, 19. Yeah, this... I'm thinking I may want to play these cards to play around N, but if he ends, he's in such a bad spot. I think I'll hold these cards. I think they're better served in the hand than just trying to end proof. Because so I think he's in a rough spot if he just uh, goes N here. Unless his four cards are very good. Oh, you can just claw slash KO, that's fine. So. Top decking a ball search card would be awesome. That's not quite it. Still have other. Oh, that's not my full deck, is it? <laughs> we can still figure out this. Uh, two, four, six, eight, ten, one, ten. Let's do this. Field player is fine.
So we currently don't have a means of Guzmaring next turn. Which is kind of what we need, right? Because he's going to retreat this and swing with this. We also don't have a means of ending, which really sucks. Which means I need to get another inkale on this board. 5, 10, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21. It's a risk, but we have to do it. We have to put an ink down on this board. So that we can power up something big enough to deal with a ready rock in one hit, because we don't have a Guzma. So. His jet stack is doing 16 right now. We have to dodge strong energy choice band. Three strongs down, one choice band down. Diancy is dead. Been a very odd game. They have floats down for their bench. And a Cynthia. Six cards. They need to find their last strong and choice band. They still have potential artillery coming out. They have Max Elixir going on to Regirock, so that's ready to attack. They have choice band. Oh, is that enough? No, that ain't enough. They're just going to have to pay retreat here. Bedrock press. So we have our thingamajigger in deck. One cool trick you need to know, uh, need to remember as well, is that you can actually uh, Brooklyn Hill out Marshadow in this matchup if you need to, ever. Just the more you know. So we have two energy left in our 16 card deck and one elixir, so this isn't guaranteed. But we did get it in the end, so that's nice. Mewtwo gets through all effects, so the bedrock press doesn't matter, the reduction. But either way, we do 200, so... Would have been enough, even if it didn't have that little cool bit of text right there. But we were narrowly able to squeak it, even though we did have awkward supporterless hand for... Well, not supporterless, only Guzma. But we did eventually get there, and able to take down the Buzzrock. They didn't have their ideal turns, we didn't have our ideal turns. And when both players draw suboptimally, normally it's the matchup that will win out, and uh, we were fortunate enough to do that. Had to take a risk on that last turn. Um, but thanks to Fury Belt, we were able to take that risk with a bit more comfort. Let's move into the next game. Not to win the flip, we'll go first. We got ourselves a mulligan. You know what would have been great in that game? An Oranguru. But let's ignore that fact for now. Every game I play without Guru, I'm like, man, you know who's awesome here? That's right. <laughs> you know what I mean? Just drawing cards in general. We have another very awkward hand. Very awkward. So this deck has seven ball search outs, one Lele. So that's eight. We have 18 turn one outs to a draw supporter. And we've managed to hit none. I mean, we can lose the game if I don't put down a bench Pokemon. We could lose to, like, nah, it's too likely with Mewtwo. Okay. Uh, even a Mewtwo full bursting is a problem. 
We're going to play this elixir to have one less bad pop deck. And pass. This really isn't ideal though. Putting down a psychic weak Pokemon in a mirror is not good. It's our only means of dealing with the Dawn Wings, like in the best case scenario, but it's still really not good for us. They have turn one Lele. They can wander tag. They get themselves Bridget instead of having a more standard turn one than we are. They play Hooper as well. They're teched. They're playing Parallel and Hooper. This is going to be a really hard matchup, especially when we're drawing nothing. Oh my god. Not like this. Not like this. Uh, if I goose like this, it's actually the least likely to portal strike, I guess. I'm going to keep the GX active because the Malamar's worth more. I'm not going to field blow just yet. So our hand's not going anywhere. There's the perfect treasure discard, finding a Malamar. into a second trip. Their hand was flames, man. Absolute flames. But they've had to put down a second Lele, and that's amazing for us. That is amazing for us. So good. Look at his board now. His board is so less so much less threatening now. We know we're not getting knocked out this turn. And other than this Hooper, you can only power up Energy Drive, and that is great for us. Really, really good for us. So we force ourselves a turn with our clownery. And with that turn, we draw. Ah. Hmm. Hmm. Yes. Yes, that's not ideal. Playing down more Psychic Week Pokemon. Okay. Maybe he needs to play an end to get a Float Stone. Maybe. Just... <laughs> We're in trouble. We're in a lot of trouble. Here's some elixirs though. Guru's going back into this list. I don't care what anyone says. <laughs> okay, okay. Well, we got rid of some painful discards though. But they're super ahead. Make no mistake. Super duper ahead. Oh my goodness, we're alive. Okay. Took you long enough end, but I'm glad to see you, bro. Jabroni. Uh, do I want to just sack this other folks' name? Nah. They have got rid of two field blowers, but I'll keep it. Now, if I really want to, I could deal with this super. But I think if we do that, we lose the game. So I think we again must go a little bit more passively. This Hooper used Portal Strike, so it can't one-bang anything if I throw the 
this into the active, the this, you know what I mean. It can it can deal with the Malamar, I guess, but I did leave the enter four goes well, you know. That's the that's the hope here. They haven't played any Guzmas yet though. They're gonna parallel off two of their own Lele's. Do they have another field blower? They must play three field blowers if they're ready to do this. This hyperspace punch is doing a 60 to our active. Pay retreat, okay. Oh, nice. Well, they have to hypnosis now. I guess they're just saying, well, you don't have N. I mean, you don't have Guzma. My two card hand, which is true. Very true. You get the big old wake up, which is nice. Talks like a Mali. That's chill. We'll take that. It's an insta play. We'll plant this on here. And we'll drop the end on him. Fury Bub doesn't mean much right now. We actually missed energy. No. <laughs> uh, why, game? Why you do this to me? That's really harsh. I thought we drew bad enough for this game. Okay. Hmm. Hmm. <laughs> Definitely a thinker turn. Good way. The only saving grace is that he's got a parallel on his own side, so this Hooper's the only attacker he can make right now. He can make a Malamar, but it can't one hit this. Yeah, he's trying to make a Mali at this point. We've already seen Fury about those, so he's not going to play a mix of both. Okay, he's going to Mally down our Mally. Pretty clever. Playing it in as well. So we need more inky stuff. <laughs> we are running kind of low on resources. We've played two Guzmas and two Ns already. So it's our last N and our second to last Guzma. I'm thinking, is it enough to deal with this Malamar here? Is it enough? He's still yet to play a Guzma. Now with a... F oh, he's played one, sorry. If I Guzma this, he can just get any attacker down alongside Guzma. If I just... I think I'm just dealing with a Mali here.
They already have two of the discard piles, so it doesn't make sense to do anything else. I think I'm also holding on to N. We're going to be as passive as possible, because I think we need to... If he's going to Guzma this next turn, we need to end him, and Moons Eclipse him. So we'll just hold everything for now, see where that takes us. We're freeing up a bench space for him, but we need to take prizes, you know, that is a thing. And we'll see what our opponent comes up with here. Whether or not they, uh, if it has Guzman, they just promote a Mali here. Okay, that's the telltale sign of either a Floatstone or a Guzma coming down this turn. Yep, there it is. And they're going to take the big juicy two prizes. Are they going to bench anything else? They bench the Mewtwo. <laughs> okay. So the Mewtwo gets around our uh, GX attack. So does he have a second Guzma in his hand? Does he have a runner runner Guzma to beat us essentially? That's what we have to do here. We have to GX his Mewtwo this turn and hope he doesn't have a runner runner Guz. That's basically all we can prey on here. It's one of the reasons why Mewtwo is so good for mirror situations like this. We lose to all forms of Guzma, so we should do this. Uh, I guess I just do this actually. What's gonna do more? Uh, if we use our jet attack this turn, Mewtwo is actually a worse attacker than this guy. Each one does stretcher ideally, but I need to start attaching to something. I could hold off on using the GX attack again this turn, but it's just so easy for him to bench a Pokemon, Mally Mally attach dead. So it has to be our GX turn here. He could still Marsh Shadow or Stretcher back this Mewtwo though. Feels like he's got us. I think uh, once he like that whiff detachment turn alongside the obvious whiff supporter turns for turns two and three. Uh, we're obviously big contributing factors to all this, but uh, let's see if he has a third Guzma here. There it is. Okay. Can't be too salty about that, really. Awkward hands there in the other turns. They had turn one Bridget parallel on our side into double Malamar turn two. They had pretty much everything going. We had to put down Marshadows and other things like that, which was kind of ridiculous, so... We did what we had to do to survive, and we weren't able to lock him out with our ends, unfortunately. Let's get one more game in. So far, drawn pretty poorly both times, and I'm considering that Guru goes straight back into this deck. Hopefully we have a nicer, nicer hand to navigate. This is a nice opening hand. Beating Mewtwo is oftentimes fine. <clears throat> Looks like we're in a mirror though. So again, Psychic Weakness is a liability when you see this guy drop down onto the board straight away. And they get a really nice Ultra Ball of two Psychic Energies already. Dragging themselves Lele. Wonder Tag. Doing the thing and the stuff. Here comes Bridget. Looks like it's an Ultra Mist. They attach to the Ultra. 
And they're going to invasion to be active so that uh, they protect their ink here, of course. We can have a pretty reasonable turn here ourselves. Nearly is in deck. So against the Ultra, we do need to, uh, we do need to have means of one hit KOing it, and that's oftentimes via stuff that's psychic weak, like our Mewtwo and our Regna Necrozmas. So that's why we're slightly unfavored in Mirror, I would say. But uh, we'll see if we can uh, make stuff happen here. I'm definitely invasioning. I'm probably retreating into Lele here. And I think I need to attach to the Mewtwo. Need to threaten his big boy. Somehow. So we'll do that. I think, uh, I mean, promoting an Inke here lets him just get one manual attachment plus Floatstone any Malamar plus Floatstone. Allows him to start powering up something else like the Dawn Wings, which insta responds by Mewtwo. If I promote the Lele, it forces him to commit more energies to the Ultra. And then he doesn't have backup attackers, but the Squids are backups anyways always. So I think we will actually do this. Seeing as though we have no side. Psych energy in the bin, I think it's okay. You already have the stretcher to instant return the ink. That is gonna sick them all. They do have floatstone, so they're gonna be taking a prize this turn, most likely. There's a turn attachment, that's enough. So we're definitely going to need the help of Psych Energy plus Discard Card for Malamar. And then another Energy for the Mewtwo. Or we're going to need an Elixir. There's an Elixir straight away. That's so good for us. We can recover this Inkay immediately. So good for us. Oh my goodness, that's awesome. Don't think I want to play N just yet, because I think we're going to be on the back foot for a portion of this game. And he didn't get any Malamars from his own Sycamore, so... Let's go for Cynthia. Ah, oh, sad violins. I could Ultra Ball Guru if I played the good card. Ah, oh, that's a serious sad violin right there. Okay, so now what is our route to victory? Retreat, hit, GX. Hope he doesn't have an answer to GX alongside Nen. If we retreat, hit, he can come in with Dawn Wings KO. We KO his Dawn Wings with our Dawn Wings. That's ideal. This is not good for him. I think we also need to put down the ink. This is this is a problem, I think. Play eleven energy and we still whiff more than most. Feels bad, man. Choice fan, so I'm gonna start getting some Mallies down. Looks like it was either top decked or prizes. I can start powering up the beast. Whoa, that 
that's really good for us. Okay. Oh my goodness, that's great for us. Okay, we're alive. Ha ha ha! Oh, you like them apples? Um. Okay. I didn't expect this to happen. So we can still do the thing and the stuff and the, the thing. Uh, but I still need to GX this, right? Unless we get hella energy. Ideally we can save our GX attack, but I don't think we'll be able to. Oh. Well now. We did hit some energy cards. We want to increase our elixir odds here. And I think... Uh, we'll never get a fourth. We've already played our stretcher, right? We could save ourselves a GX attack if I hit Elixir on Mewtwo. We could do full burst for 3, 6, 9, 12, 15. Uh, alternatively, we could GX attack with Dormings this turn. Um, I don't want a GX attack if I can help it, so let's go for the invasion. Let's play this on the Ultra Ball, because we have all the squids to use it, and we can increase our odds by one. And we're drawing an extra card, uh, because our hand is fairly dead. If this hits, we're in Dreamland. Okay, nice. Saving our GX attack is a big deal. Three, six, nine, twelve, fifteen, yeah. We have Guzma for next turn for his GX attack turn. So this is this is looking pretty gravy. Burst to the fullest. They've only managed one Malamar so far as well, which is good for us. Lots of energy in their discard pile, lots of psychics. They're going to attach a metal energy. Okay, B string turn. That's fine. <clears throat> as long as there's no end here, we're laughing. They're going this route. They're, spent, they're choosing not to use their GX attack. Which actually lets us use our GX attack on him. So we go GX here, 180. Yep. And we gotta think. Next turn his hand needs to be attachment Guzma for it to not be right to put this down. It's also wrong to 
it's also not right to put it down if we think he has n. So I think we should play around n by playing this. Ourselves two away, forcing Guzma really for him to stay in the game. Picking up Ultra Ball and Sycamore pretty much wraps the game up for us. He's going to promote the Inke. Do they have a means of Guzmaring our guy? I mean, Guzma is scary and it's not scary because we know we have game in hand, but I think he needs to think about Guzmaring our guy because we're basically threatening game on board right now. There's the Malamar. So it needs attachment or another Malamar. Plus Guz. Alternative is to keep Inke active and just play N and hope that off of his end he can find a means to Guzmaring next turn and hope that we can't get Guzmaring off our two cards. He's going to treasure, so he has the out to Malamar if he wants to go for a Guzma line. I think the N line is actually better than the Guzma line, the more I think about it. But I would say that, I, I just got a Sycamore and an Ultra Ball off prizes. Perhaps before I would have said the other way around. <laughs> okay, they're getting themselves a Lele. So they're getting their choice of supporter at the, the least. And what will they go for? They do go for Guzma. That's fine. We can take that. Yeah, and they can concede. I think realistically their best play was actually a Hypnosis N play, something like that. That was probably their best line. It could have put us into more awkward spots, but three games where we didn't draw optimally, I think the inquest of Oranguru goes on. I think I could have used that in a lot of games, to be fair. Um, and also the inquest of one Lele. It's also scary times, but we've seen Malamar players, both Malamar players put down two Leles against me, and they both... Uh, well, one won, one lost, but it was awkward. Like, you can see how awkward it is on their bench at times. So, definitely debates to be had. Let me know what you guys think about this list. Let me know about Oranguru, my boy, and how I can try and work him back into this list. Let me know what you think about Fury Belt as well, because that's one that I'm uncertain of, and it's what's been a recent introduction to the list, and I've been 50-50 on it myself. I'm not sure if it's perfect for this deck or not, but yeah. That's going to be it, guys, for Psychic Malamar. Let me know what you think about the archetype. And uh, we're going to be getting back into deck videos a lot more now that the schedule's getting back on track. I'm getting uh, my life back together now that I can walk again, which is awesome. So there we go. And, uh, yeah, see you guys in another video soon. Cheers.